according to my Garmin timepiece anyway. So um, I think I know most everybody here, but in the event you don't know who I am, uh, I'm Greg Young. I'm the pastor here, um, retired chaplain with the FBI, still a chaplain with the Germantown Police Department. Um, during the week, I, I uh, respond to a lot of bad stuff. As a matter of fact, last week um, was in Sockville for a little boy who was uh, seven years old. Um, they called me up there, a uh, different jurisdiction, who had hung, was found hanging in his bedroom. So, so the, you know, I, I do that. I was involved with Sandy Hook and, and the Sikh Temple mass shooting and all of that stuff. And, and I also help first responders deal with, with the stress and the trauma and then have to help, you know, deal with that myself as, as well. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, those of you who weren't here for the first time, um, back in 2019 in November, um, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn, which is kind of a professional site, you know, and I've got like 10 or 11,000 contacts. It's kind of like a Rolodex, you know, for business people these days. And uh, I think, Joe, we're probably connected in that, as I remember, right? So, yeah. Um, so, and if there's anybody else here I'm connected to on LinkedIn, I'm connected to a lot of you on Facebook. But anyway, LinkedIn, um, you know, please forgive me if I don't remember that. But um, a gentleman by the name of Yaroslav Malko contacted me. Uh, he was in Ukraine, and they were at that time in 2019. Now, what you need to understand is in 2014, um, Russia did, of course, the whole Crimea thing. But then, you know, a lot of people think, well, the, Rus the, the Ukrainians were, were, were pestering or torturing the people in the East. That isn't true at all. I mean, you, boots in the ground experience will tell you. I mean, I was in, I was in Mariupol, I was in Lizachansk, I was in Kharkiv, uh, all of those areas. In fact, met with the um, police chief in Mariupol who was just freed by the Russians, and I've got a picture of them in the slide. Um, but, but they actually had Russian sharpshooters in Kyiv um, shooting people in, in the central square, uh, in, you know, back, back then. So I mean, it was like, you know, Russia has always been kind of the invading force here. You know, so when I read things on social media that, no, no, they deserve it. That, that's just not true. It's not true at all. Um, I mean, you really need to have been there, you know, to really, to really understand that. So we went over there. We, I met with the Secretary of Internal Affairs, um, and he, uh, he made, made the decision in 2019 that he wanted us to, uh, he wanted to open up their national police to peer support programs and chaplaincy. And they were going to bring over a lot of the military chaplains and train them, and we were going to train them to be chaplains in Ukraine uh, for their police, their national police, patrol police. So uh, he said, could you bring five officers over? And I brought five officers from the Midwest, uh, some from the Milwaukee area, Waukesha area, uh, Germantown, as well as in Iowa. And we were over there, and we went to Mariupol first and met with the, the uh, police chief there and all of these places, and just so made all of these contacts. And then in the years since 2019, I did a lot of virtual training for their chaplaincy program, which is actually endorsed and connected directly to the national police program. They wanted to be like the US. In fact, one person came up to me with tears from the government and said, please don't forget about us. We want to be like you, you know, which is why I feel so passionate about that kind of a ministry, you know, in the trenches that I do. So I'm, I'm thank you all of you for being here. I'm going to teach you how to say good evening in Ukrainian right now, if you're ready. Okay? You ready? So the first part of this is, is going to be dobre, dobre, vitr, vitr, dobre vitr. Put it together now. Ah, the akiu. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, I will also teach you how to say goodbye later on, so uh, pestering all of you. So we're going to go and get started. Um, this particular trip that we had, I only took, I wanted people, they said, could you come over? And a colonel, who's a good friend of mine with the National Police, who's heading up the war crimes investigators uh, stuff there, he said, um, he actually approached Alex Gerasimov, a good friend of mine, uh, who's an industrial engineer in Atlanta, um, great U.S. citizen. He, um, he actually, he, Alex had gone over there and, and he said, do you know somebody who can talk to us about moral trauma? He says, I know a person. And that person happened to be me, you know, because I do a lot of that work with PTSD, um, uh, moral trauma, and stuff like that. So, uh, so I picked a team, Tim Felton from Iowa, 
Um, he teaches active shooter training uh, and officer-involved shooting, those kinds of things uh, in Iowa. He had to leave, um, he, he had to leave uh, his work with the Sheriff's Department when he actually was stabbed by somebody who was high, you know, with unmeth. So, uh, but, he, uh, but he's a great guy. He's a prince of a guy. If he was here, it's, he always calls me master. I don't know why he calls me master. And I call him grasshopper. And in fact, if you call me grasshopper, you may call me, uh, you want me to call you uh, quasi or, you know, but, but grasshopper. It says, oh, master, we bow at your feet. And it's like, and I said, cut it out. But we, you know, we tease each other, right? We got to be light, especially when you're going to a horrific thing like that. So I'm going to show you some difficult pictures. I'm not going to show you any bodies or anything like that. I will tell you a lot of stories, but I also want to leave time for Q&A. And I've got a few. I don't have a lot of show and tell stuff up here, uh, but I do have a few things to kind of look at, like some of the different badges, you know, that they wear, uh, as well as a couple of medals from the government that I, they made me wear when I was over there, which is why they were calling me General, Admiral, whatever. You know, there is no such probably rank, is there, Joe? General, Admiral. They kind of cover all of the bases here. So anyway, um, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, hopefully, this will be meaningful. If you have any questions along the way, uh, please just feel free. So I'm going to move up here a little bit, and, and I'm going to keep an eye on this guy right here. So all right, moving on. Now, one of the first things I'm going to show you are suitcases. Grace, my wife back here, um, as in Europe, it's not as bad now, but, but early on, there was a real problem with luggage, check baggage getting lost all over Europe, not just, we're not, because like we couldn't fly to Ukraine, but everywhere in Europe, Britain, France, you know, wherever, uh, the Netherlands, all of those places. So she actually had gone to Goodwill, which is actually a good place to go to check out stuff sometimes. She got a couple of these, one she paid like five bucks for, right, Grace, and the other was seven. And I thought, okay, so we had medical supplies. I do a lot of training for uh, Aurora Bay Care up in uh, Green Bay and West Dallas Aurora by the way, wants me to, uh, we get, they wants me to do some training for them now too, so, because I know you're connected to Aurora. Uh, so anyway, but they gave me medical supplies, trauma kits and stuff like that. And there's a toy maker in Green Bay by the name of Rick, Rick Rick's Toy Box. He's a tall, skinny guy. I mean, he's a real, what we call ectomorph. I mean, he's just skinny. He's got a little kind of a, a squared off bush beard. Uh, great guy. Um, he, he makes toys. And I said, well, I, I got room for a few, you know, everything we have. To, those were the check bags. Um, and he said, I'll make you 300. And he's got all these volunteers. So I made 300 of these wooden toys. Um, they're, they're basically cars. Uh, and actually, I give to Angie in our church. She, we, I give her a box because we have some left over to uh, actually um, to give to the inner city kids and stuff like that as part of our ministry. But I, I, so I had Grace pick up some duct tape, bright yellow, neon yellow. I wanted it to stand out. So, and then I wrote, you can see what I wrote on there, humanitarian, uh, Ukraine. And, and I thought to myself, you know, the baggage handler is going to have one or two responses. Number one, that, oh, man, there's so much stuff going to Ukraine, you know, ah, they won't miss that. Or maybe this is important uh, because we also had, uh, you know, toiletry items that, I, that a woman who cuts my hair, she brought to, by the house one day, little bows for like, little girls and stuff like that who might want to just pretty part of their hair. And all of our baggage came through. It, came, it went through. So we were thankful. This is Alex Garazimov. This is at the airport in Paris. By the way, I don't like the Paris airport. I, I rank airports. I've been through a lot of them. Uh, and we had not slept, but we had like a, a fairly long layover because we flew from Paris then to Warsaw, Poland, where we had a team of chaplains, a chaplain to pick us up. But Alex, he just give you, he's an industrial engineer, in Atlanta, he is a uh, an assistant pastor in a large, uh, it would be like Slavic uh, evangelical Christian church, and he he told me once in our trip in 2019, he told me when he and Jeff Smith and I and you know we were all together, and he said he said if you and Jeff and Tim come back, sign me up, I want to do this. But he also told him he said Greg, you're an infection. So now he is a he is a he is now a chaplain with the sheriff's department. And, you know, got him trained and stuff like that. And I said, well, I got some more stuff for you, Alex. So, but the, he and his wife also own a bakery. And the bakery in the Atlanta area. And what they do with that bakery is they'll use it as a place for Bible studies when they have Bible study. But it's also a place where they actually, disabled people in the Atlanta area are brought in. And they could teach them a skill like making cinnamon rolls 
or something like that, which is really, really nice. So Alex is, is a dear friend. Um, everybody over there calls each other brother or sister, so um, get used to that. This is in Warsaw Airport, um, you know, sleep deprived, you know. And this is, this is Eugene. Eugene was our driver. He is one of the chaplains I trained. In fact, I had not seen him except virtually, um, you know, over the years. You know, he was involved with some of that stuff. And he, his wife, and they got a daughter who's on the autism spectrum, are living in Warsaw. This is a Warsaw, and we loaded up. You'll notice they've got all of these nice vans. Samaritan's Purse has been a huge contributor. And some of these vans are actually armored because we do go into harm's way. We, you know, we were in harm's way. Um, we didn't go as far east as we'd like to, but, but anyway. But I don't want to tell my wife that, but anyway. So anyway, but, uh, but, but anyway. So um, he picked us up. But he came up and he threw himself in my arms because he's just a short little guy. And it's like, you know, I haven't seen you forever. You know, it's just like brothers, right? And so this is, he, he picked us up, airport. This is, this is, now you think, I don't want to see, these are just like tourist pictures. Downtown Warsaw, we, the team, Alex, um, Alex and I, I flew to Atlanta. Alex and I flew to Paris, to Warsaw, and we were there several hours prior to Tim. And John, who's a Lutheran pastor, he was a school superintendent for many years, and he, he wanted to know, John did, what are we doing every second, every minute? And I said, John, we're going into a war zone. I said, we can have things kind of planned out, but we have to be fluid. We have to be fluid. And so uh, we were waiting for John and Tim to fly out of Minneapolis to meet us. Uh, they actually flew into Amsterdam in medicine and medicine in Warsaw. So yes, they, we had coffee, and they took a lot of pictures. And uh, this is Alex. This would be Eugene's wife and his daughter. We're going to try to get her to the United States to get her some, you know, some help with, with you know, where, where she lies in the autism spectrum. Okay, now, you're probably wondering, what does this look like? Warsaw, Poland, none of the roads, because there are a lot of bombed areas, a lot of bridges were out, and they had, you know, like these, subs, you know, these temporary bridges and stuff. So just to let you know where our first stop was, and this kind of, we kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of muddied up here, but our first stop was in Rivne, which was bombed yesterday, by the way. Um, there were, every major city in Ukraine was bombed by Putin, uh, in response to the Crimean uh, bridge uh, attack. And um, so there were like 80 some missiles launched strategically and they hit playgrounds and c civilian areas. Uh, they were indiscriminately, you know, out there, not, not tactical targets. Uh, so we're in Rivni, and so yeah, that's gonna be the first set of pictures you're gonna see. And from there we were in Kiev, we went through Bucha. Bucha made the news after February 24th, 25th, when Russia, you know, was, was in that area. And they got as far as Bucha, uh, which is basically a suburb of Kiev, and the Russians were stopped there. Okay. Uh, from there, we went down to all the way down to Dnipro. As you can see, Dnipro is getting pretty close to where all the action was, although we heard air raid sirens when we were eating borscht, you know, at a restaurant or something. Like, and, and life was going on in spite of the, the terrible loss. Now, what I want to show you is over here, the distances. But we can't think of it in terms of how good our, I'm never going to complain about how bad our roads are. Um, I mean, given this is a war zone, you know, and they've had tanks on them and everything else. But Warsaw to Rivna is 470 kilometers, 292.5 miles. That was almost 10 hours. Going through the checkpoints take a long time, uh, especially if you're trying to leave Ukraine. If you're trying to leave Russia now, <laughs> like a lot of young guys are trying to do to avoid being drafted in a war that, you know, that's like, why are we there, kind of thing. Uh, but Rivna to Bucha is 321 kilometers, 200 miles. Bucha to Kiev, I want you to pay attention to that, is, is where the Russians did a lot of their, their war crime stuff. is only about 21.2 miles. Not very far. What, West Bend to the southern part of Germantown, maybe, right? Kiev to Dnipro, and by the way, you see this, well, it says, Greg, it says Dnipro, but you pronounce it, you, you drop the, the D, it's Dnipro, Dnipro, um, and been there a couple of times, actually. 314 miles, Dnipro to Lubny, which is where there was a police. You're going you're gonna to see all of these places. Uh, 180 miles, uh, Lubny to, to Kiev, 130 miles. Kiev to Warsaw, 507 miles, and that took forever. So our trip, air miles, was about 11,640, best I could figure. 
you know, depending on whether pilots had to kind of go this way, who knows. By van on the roads, 2,642 kilometers. We averaged about three or four hours of sleep a night, and I presented every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. So um, it, it, this one took quite a while to get over. It wasn't just jet lag. I was just exhausted. Okay. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So there's Ridna, the oblast. That is like a province. When you hear the word oblast, you know, like in, in Eastern European, it's, it's, like, it's like, think of a province like in Canada or something, okay? So that's where we were first. This is meeting first thing in the morning. I saw a lot of the chaplains that we trained there who are kind of in that section, in that oblast. Um, but we wanted, the, the police officials there wanted to meet with us. Uh, and so, you know, of course, the, the way they do it, they always like the person who's a team leader to be the person who kind of speaks, does most of the speaking. Well, that was unfortunately little old me, you know, but... Uh, but there's a picture. You're going to notice I don't have, they wanted me to wear my uniform. You'll notice I got a medal on. They wanted me, they're really big on medals over there, to wear one of the national medals that I had, they had already presented to me. Um, but they've got blue shirts on. Those are shirts I had made by a woman named Jean Pritchard, I think here, in, that, uh, that Anna had, had told me about. And they said, uh, which is my website, Resilient Response, but then it said, Resurrecting Hope in crisis with a Ukrainian flag in it. So those are shirts and people think, are you guys a part of a cult or what? No. <laughs> All right. Everywhere you go. So we met there first thing in the morning. Then we went up to meet the mayor. The mayor wanted to meet with us, all these city officials. Um, they were actually having to make death notifications. Uh, city officials were. Not just police, but city officials. A lot of the police were actually put into a different mode in trying to actually help rescue people and provide humanitarian aid. Okay, so this, you saw this kind of stuff every, everywhere. All right, so that's the city building. Um, now, this is, if you look at him, doesn't he look like, before the war began, um, Zelensky? And he's short, he's short like Zelensky. Um, great guy, and they always like, over there, they have interesting dynamics. They want either the team leader, if you have a team, sitting either adjacent to or directly across from, if you're in a conference room, the, you know, the, the, the top dog or whoever that is, you know, that you're going to be there with. So I sat next to him. And they, they have all kinds of plans of trying to, they've got a refugee center. They're trying to do, do all kinds of things for people who are fleeing. Uh, of course, Rivney was just bombed, and I, I'm trying to get reports. Uh, and that's, that's, um, that's almost up in, um, um, it's almost, yeah. It's, it's way north, northwest, so, but great guy, uh, great program, so you'll see some slides. Right here, what I would show you, you, can, you probably can't see it way in the back, but, but just to give you a sense, this, this guy's a chaplain, these are chaplains, he's like a bishop, like an Episcopal type bishop type person, and he he's big bombastic. In fact, my, my, uh, I, I had problems with my um, shingles when I was there. He says, we pray for you, you know, just a big booming voice. And he had all of the chaplains that happened to be around when we were there lay their hands on me like, <laughs> ouch, ouch, ouch. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, and this is Pablo. He heads a national chaplain's program, uh, former military. And that's his wife. And this is John. The, uh, he's now ELCA Lutheran pastor. And this is Alex, of course. And here's Tim, uh, the one that always calls me master. Greg, he's a, he's a prince of a guy. And so, and, and of course, the mayor. So just, but they wanted to make those connections and they do want us to come back. But he had arranged for the next day, um, I did four trainings, presentations in a big ballroom that they had in another building. Okay. The first time I actually shed some tears. Like I'm actually a pretty strong guy, you know, inside. Um, this was a refugee center. And of course, when the war broke out, everybody's fleeing in the east and they're trying to get as far away as they can you know, to get, you know, either in Poland or Moldova or some of those places. So this is a picture of the refugee center. These are those cars right here. Um, and we let our hearts speak to us as to what we were going to be delivering where. Uh, these are those little wooden cars. And, and the guy who made them, this Rick toy box up in Green Bay, he said, don't eat the suckers. They had crayons on the bottom strapped on so the kids could color the car, do whatever, you know. You know, because remember, it's a war zone. It's not like they're going to... We're going to give them video games or something like that or a tablet necessarily. Uh, and, but he said, Greg, don't eat the suckers. Don't eat the suckers. Those are for the kids. So, but anyway, but 
So the, we found their distribution center. I said, this is the place where those toys are going. So it's interesting how our heart spoke to us. Uh, next picture, because I know, I, I, you know, I don't like Sheila, you were talking about the thing you got on your recent, your recent second honeymoon vacation. Um, this, this right here. Um, when we were there, a lot of the refugees had already had, had come, and they were still trickling in. But those that come in, any of you work in the first responder world know there's something called the thousand-yard stare. Uh, when a person's traumatized, it's like, hello, I'm not there. And this woman and her daughter came. She had lost her husband. Uh, they lost their home. They had fled the east. No money. Just the shirt, their clothes on their back. And so this refugee center, you know, they were able to, they, they actually had chaplains and police that were actually transporting people back and forth at the risk of their own life, you know, and, and bringing people. So she was there, and she went up to the front counter. I noticed when I came in the lobby, and then up on the second floor, um, what we noticed was before this picture here, is that we had half of our monies that were donated by all of you generous folk for this trip uh, that were in cash, and, and I had two debit card accounts set up, okay? Because those will come in handy. Uh, talking about those. One is actually with a business PayPal account, um, you know, just with the limited funds. It was only a card for that, no name on it. And so uh, we were going to kind of divvy up. And, and by the way, first hotel we stayed at in Rivney was actually be like about a four-star hotel, you know, because it wasn't bombed. Um, what do you think it cost? What do you think it cost per person to stay just a, a couple of nights? You want to take a guess? We're thinking U.S. dollars. Anybody would take a guess? How much? You're thinking 25? Oh man, you're lowballing me here. And it was like it was like 35 or 40 a, a night. So, uh, which is like th that's all, because they told us it would th this trip would cost us a hundred dollars a day per person when I'm planning for my team. A hundred dollars a day, you know, for the eight nine days whenever we're there. So we also wanted to have money to be available to give it discretion, you know, you know where, where we could. So my friend Alex here, we went out in the hallway. Eugene was sitting out there, the, 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 our driver. And I was out in the hallway, and, and he was asking for some money. And, and I had, you know, quite a bit of, of cash and, and the two cards. And I thought, well, you know, maybe she could use some money because it sounded like I could get her set up. And so he brought in some money to her, and, and I added to that. But then I had to walk out in the hall and just wipe a couple of tears away. You know, just like, it's just, well, you know, I'm a compassionate guy. And, uh, but then it's interesting, Tim, uh, you'll see a picture of him later on from Iowa. He saw this teddy bear somewhere. The brand new had a tag on it. And he, th he, he had a heck of a time stuffing that thing into, because we, we, they told us to bring everything in your, in your roller bag that comes on the plane, you know. Um, and I, I don't know how he got that on there, in there, but he said, this is where it needs to go. And he gave it to this little girl. Momentary moment of this brightening her life for a moment, okay? Um, a lot of volunteers. Uh, we, had, we had prayers with them and stuff like that too. So, it, um, so that was our that's the second part of that first day. Okay, so this is dog food. That, 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 that center also became an area because you, you don't think about pets. You might think about pets. But, but you know, when you're war and you're getting places bombed, and the pets, you know, are, are traumatized. They're running around loose, you know. And so they've got actually organizations, international organizations, that go in like, you know, like with the, uh, the recent hurricane in Florida. You know, when I was at, at Katrina, same thing, part, when I was part of the strike team. So a picture of me with some dog food. So that's, that's a lot of dog food, right, Tim? All right. So this is day two, um, where I presented moral trauma, complicated grief and loss in war, making death notifications, and I actually made them practice that with a translator, and individual and family um, war crime victims' needs in time of war. That one I had not planned on, but Pablo said, Greg, he said, I mean, he knew me from all these virtual trainings. He said, he says, speak two hours on, on you know, on, on what family needs are and, you know, what chaplain needs are, and I thought, okay. So we sat down, and we did it, so... Um, so this is, this, as you can see, there's a lot of people here, uh, a lot of government officials, a lot of police, a lot of psychologists 
um, that were there. This little guy here, um, Alex was originally my translator, but he speaks Russian. Now, Eastern Ukraine speaks Russian. That doesn't mean that they belong to Russia, but a lot of them are speaking, you know, we're speaking Russian. But over the years, they tried to, you know, in that, in that language, develop their own language in Ukrainian. And this guy's a Ukrainian translator. Uh, he's a friend of mine, too. So this is actually, this is a government, a city official, and I'm actually um, having them do a role play scenario on a death notification, you know, related to a war. So uh, that, that was what was going on. It's a part of that whole thing. Um, now, um, my wife and I have a good relationship, right, sweetie? I hope, yeah. <laughs> but when somebody, the, these gals wanted a picture with me, and Alex is standing off to the side, and he said, don't let Grace see that. You'll be in trouble. <laughs> these are either government officials, military officials, Three of them are psychologists. So they were very interested in hearing about moral trauma. So, um, but anyway, and this guy here, they gave us all kinds of things, notebooks and some things like that. But, uh, but he's, he's like one of the police officials there. And you can, you can kind of tell, you know, the rank. So, all right. All right, moving on. Any questions so far? That afternoon, after a full day of teaching at that ballroom, they wanted us to go to a outside the city limits there and do some training. Now, if you look at these, it looks like military uniforms. Those are all police. But they're there to protect the city, you know, especially trained to protect the city because everybody's having to, to kind of, you know, when you're invaded like, you know, like, like they were in Russia, having to do that. So I had to present a moral trauma with no PowerPoint. Imagine that, right? Okay. So and this is John. He's making notes and me, and it was hot, humid. And on the other side of that fence were chickens. You could hear chickens, you know, and uh, this is an interesting place. It's still in the process of being developed. Now, I want you to notice, I want you to look very closely at this, at this picture here. Tell me, what, what looks different about the overhead signs? It looks like a typical freeway or interstate, doesn't it? What well, is? Uh-huh. Rochelle, why is that? Mm -hmm. They did that with the Russians because that was when the war broke out. When the war broke out, this is the highway that all those Russian vehicles and, you know, like a, a gazillion mile formation. I don't know what kind of military formation or tactic that happens to be or strategy, you know, Dale. But, uh, but they, they actually, you know, they became sitting ducks. Some people said, oh, they just kind of a gesture of goodwill. They left on their own. B.S. Don't believe that for a minute. Um, you know, it was bloody, it was, you know, it was a, a war. And a lot of the generals actually had their parade uniforms with them that were killed that we saw um, because they thought they were going to go into Kiev and that they're going to denazify Ukraine, who has a Jewish president, by the way, um, and um, do all of that kind of stuff. And, and turn out, you know, but they just thought they were going to waltz in there and people were going to just, you know, just throw flowers and hug them, you know. Um, and so they, what they did was, this is on the way to Bucha, going toward Kiev. So we've left Rivna, okay? This is Bucha. Uh, actually, this is Borodyanka, which in Bucha are kind of like twin, twin cities. What I want you to notice here is you, you probably can't see, the pictures aren't the best, but do you see a smile on any of our faces that are posed there by those buildings? No. And there's a reason why. There was a lot of horrible things happened there. It's cleaned up now. But you could feel, you could feel, you could feel um, the loss. You could. And there was a young, one young woman came by, and I think John wanted to take a picture of her. The guy here in the end uh, wanted to take a picture of her, and she said, no, no, no. I mean, it's basically a ghost city. Some people are trying to come back, you know. But she said, and then, but then she said, she pointed up to a point right up here on this particular building, and she said, that used to be our home. By the way, this used to be this this used to be a high rise as well, and all the people in there perished. That big hole. Okay. All right. This is uh, Eugene and me at um, Bucha. We stopped um, momentarily because he's actually from Bucha. In fact, I got an email. I got a a messenger contact from him today, uh, saying we are back in Bucha. 
he and his family. Right now, there's a little video clip on Messenger showing, you know, just the air raid sirens and everything going off. Okay, moving on. Bucha, a suburb of Kiev where the Russian invasion really kind of ended in its attempt to overtake Kiev. Okay? Um, so I'm just trying to give you a sense of, of where things are. This would be Bucha. There's Kiev. So very close, very close. Uh, so that our next stop, we, we actually just stopped there. We didn't do anything there other than just trying to pay homage and, res and do some respect for all of the loss of life there, the women and children that were sexually assaulted, and they were raped and killed. People were shot in the street wholesale. Okay. All right. This is at a church, a very large downtown church. We were there in 19. Uh, so we get into Kiev, and right away, right to the church, we got a meal for you. You know, you have to speak. You have, we, we, this was for a chaplain's graduation in, you know, in, in Kiev. And so we're sitting there, um, you know, basically the team, and uh, they had a meal. They had a meal set out there for us in a little private room. I mean, they, th this is a, a church that's got its own cafe. It's got its own, you know, its own little restaurant. And, you know, and just, uh, it's, a, you know, they, it's a, it, but it's really kind of an outreach to the whole city, you know, the, where it is. So uh, anyway, this is before the graduation. Um, this is Colonel Ruslan. He's the, he's the person I was telling you about. In fact, he was mad at me when we saw him later, mad at me, joking, because I hadn't friended him on Facebook. So anyway, Colonel Ruslan uh, is heading up. He is a colonel with the National Police. Uh, he's heading up war crimes investigators, and he had some really nice things to say about how helpful this, this work we were doing with moral trauma for his people were doing. So we had to sign certificates. I had to sign, he had to sign, and then Pablo signed. And he, he writes faster than me, and he's, he's more illegible than I am too, so. But anyway, so they put us in a room out adjacent to the kitchen and made us do that before we went upstairs. All right, so I'm gonna show you a video uh, that they did before I had to go up and speak at the graduation. Hopefully this will come across. If I'm blocking anybody. It's kind of hard to get up and speak after that. But anyway, okay. So this is at the graduation, and I might be trying to say something funny, and Alex is kind of like, what? How am I supposed to translate that or whatever? And, and when you work with a translator a lot, you can't give them 
I can't give him a whole sermon and have him translate that. You have to give him, you know, so you get kind of in a cadence. I mean, we work together so much. So this is at the church at the graduation. So um, this is actually inside the church. It's got another level. Um, you, those who are going to be graduates. And something about those graduates. I don't know if I got any of those pictures coming up. Y yeah, here, and, and, and I am, they, they wanted me in the center in the back somewhere. So I said, can I just hide behind somebody? But, they, um, but when they would come up, I would help hand out certificates, you know, and shake their hands. Every one of them were going to be deployed to go to the, the east. They were going to actually go into the war zone itself, you know, where the active shooting is going on. And when they come up the stage, you think they were scared? No. They, in fact, I, I felt bruised afterwards because they were hugging me so hard. There was joy because they had a purpose, part of their homeland. And, you know, I'll never forget the looks in their faces. Never. That bravery, that sense of commitment and call. You know, just, uh, that's, that's why I love these people, you know. It's just great group, great group. Yeah. They're separate, but a lot of them actually have done both, and especially with the war, a lot of them took up arms. For instance, the police chief in Lizachansk, um, you know, he, he, he's out there doing spooky stuff, you know, and I, I know him, and I see he's like, I occasionally have a picture, but he's, he's on the front. So some actually have taken up arms, but a lot of them, what they're having them do, some, some actually working, um, they're psychologists. Now, they, they have psychologists actually a part of, they're sworn officers, in the police department. Um, some work both, you know. Uh, it's all hands on deck right now with, with what's been going on, Bob, to be honest with you. But the, um, but no, they, um, um, you know, they, the military, you know, the military is primarily military, so, but they had a lot of people. So interesting is that I saw a picture the other day of all the Russian young men wanting to leave Russia and all of the number of people when the war broke out of Ukrainian young men that could not wait to sign up to defend their homeland. I mean, it's, we didn't forget, there's a difference, there's a purpose, you know, and we could talk a long time about what some of that equipment looked like. I saw a lot of it um, when we were there. This is actually at the church. This guy here, he's a big wig with Samaritan's Purse, and, yeah, and he, he, uh, he spoke at the, at the graduation, didn't help with the, gra the certificates and stuff, but... Um, but they, they, they have raised a lot of money to, to actually give vans and, uh, matter of fact, a lot of food. Uh, they, they, they actually have a network through which they can channel that, you know, from into Poland, into Ukraine. So uh, a lot of pictures. Everybody wanted a picture. In fact, he and I were up there talking and said, oh, we want a picture. Oh, we want a picture. We want a picture. At one point, someplace, I, I, I actually covered my face with, with the Irmtown Police Department polo shirt, you know, just like, you know, Trying to avoid paparazzi. What? No, no, it wasn't pa paparazzi. They want. They want a picture. What's that? Um, well, when we were there in '19, Jerry, what we did was, we would speak. We would go to the police department, like Mariupol. The evening, we would go to church, and then they would send a thing out to all the different churches, regardless of denomination, including Jewish, and saying, "Would you like to be a part?" Because there's some. Don't say Russian Orthodox. Some were Ukrainian Orthodox, um, they're Baptists, or all kinds of different denominations, evangelical, whatever. They, you know, and they, so we would present there in 19. So it was part of a recruitment program. So they recruit, recruit, they uh, organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that they're recruiting now for another class, a, a new group, because. Um, they want to do it. They want to find a way to serve, you know, in their country. So, uh, so yeah, good questions, good questions. So a lot of pictures. Uh, okay, on the road again, further south and east to Dnipro. Um, I had spoken at this college once before. I'll show you a picture. But Dnipro, I want you to, what I want you to notice here is that Dnipro, where we were, it, where we were when we were there was a very high-value target. Uh, they have special military training and operations there. Um, they have, uh, you know, some Russian missiles there. They have, it's a police academy. It's also a law training for people, you know, like in pre-law who, who are that. So it's pretty, it's a really nice university, um, you know, and, and I, I presented for two hours, but you'll see that in a minute. But we were there. And in fact, John said, 
when we were walking around looking at some of the Russian missiles, I'll show you later, he said, this is probably a pretty high value target, isn't it? I said, I didn't want to tell you that, but yes, it is. So anyway, okay. Okay, now, yeah, see the scary picture in the, over here on the left? We actually took, you know, military-grade body armor. We, we, had, we got clearances to take that stuff. And we, on the way to Dnipro, uh, I said, let's pose by a cornfield and have you guys put this stuff on. <laughs> like, and we look real scary, right? <laughs> Especially when I have a weapon in our hands. But, uh, corn, but uh, sunflowers, they're the largest exporter of sunflowers and probably of, of wheat, too, in the world, you know? And when, you know, when, uh, you know, when Mariupol, the port there in the Black Sea is, is in Odessa, uh, they finally open it up so they can actually get grain to India. Uh, or Africa, excuse me, parts of Africa that depend almost entirely upon that f to live, you know? So, I mean, the whole world is interconnected, you know, a lot more than we think. This is a university uh, at Dnipro. It's, uh, it's, it's Dnipro, Dnipro, it's Dnipro Protovsk um, State University of Internal Affairs. So that's, that's where we were when I presented. This is actually, some of this is cut off. But I never forget, they had like 250 students. It's a big amphitheater. There was no air conditioning. And at least initially, Pablo was going to say some words, um, and then Alex and I, and Alex was going to interpret for me. And, uh, and so, but it was, I'll never forget, we had, we had handheld mics. And it, the, it was so hot and sweaty for two hours. I swear, we were flinging sweat on the, you know, the young men and young ladies. But notice the young ladies, young men look pretty young, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, but those are some, you know, was going to be that's their future police department, the police officers, and they're probably going to go right into. In fact, one young man was graduating, and he said, "I saw you were 19 when I was there," and one of his profs was sitting with him, uh, and we had a chance to talk. And they also wanted, they wanted selfies. They come up and they want a lot of selfies. Those students will come up and say, selfie, selfie, selfie. And never got to see any of them, but that's, that's okay. So they wanted selfies. But um, great, great group. This guy here, Carrillo Nidra, was a hero. He's a national hero of the war in 2014 when they, they actually took back an airport, Russia, and its invasion of the Crimea thing. Because uh, they didn't stop there. They also went out other places. A lot of times people understand that. They need to really understand, get the true facts here. Um, and he was a war hero. He's now a sniper. In fact, he was going to lecture after this, two lecture classes. He's a psychologist at the school. Uh, he and I have a friendship. And, um, and so I had given him, these are patches from the police departments up and around the, the Brown County um, area. So uh, that we're actually I, you know, people would send me stuff and gave it to him, but he's he's a good friend. But he was going to go, uh, he was going to go off somewhere for a little while, and and do his military thing, you know. Uh, great guy. Okay, there's some Russian missiles. It's part of a museum. Um, this this one here. Matter of fact, I can use this function. Nope, 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 nope. nope. Let's come back. Okay, let's see if we can find. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, but this, this right here is part of a nuclear weapon. It used to be a nuclear missile battery, uh, part of the, you know, that whole thing for the, for the Russians. So some of their missiles that were there, you know, it's, it's a pretty big complex this place is. Okay. Now, look how stern these guys look. They, I met, th this guy is the dean of, of, the, of the State University of Internal Affairs. Uh, you know, he, uh, I had it set so they had our names so I knew it was going to be sitting directly across from him and they always have Ukrainian and a U.S. flag everywhere I went Ukrainian and a U.S. flag you know in one of those dual holders and so uh, he was talking about this guy here and so what they wanted to do with the university is make it a resource to the whole larger city area and including spiritual meaning spiritual needs so he's going to be responsible for that this guy here was responsible for, I think, medical stuff, you know, and providing medical resources. So I knew the medical supplies I brought, this is where I need to leave them, okay? So, and this guy here, he was involved with uh, so, some, other, some, some other 
capacity, but it was all part of the outreach to the larger community, you know, just to try to serve their own people. Uh, when he finished speaking, and they turned to me and had me speak, um, and I said something, then he lightened up, so I, I don't know, I, you know, but then we talked, and he says, I remember you, thank you for coming back, and, and now, um, the story here, this is in um, Dnipro at the resort, and this young lady here, she's actually not as young as you think she is, she was in uh, Lizachansk, and her name is Oksana Kratova. And Oksana knew that we were going to be in the area. I stayed in touch with her because she was very involved as a psychologist in the oblast part where, you know, where uh, Lizachansk happens to be uh, in Luhansk area, which is very much under Russian control right now. Uh, she had lost everything, lost her home. The police department that she, was, that she came out of was bombed and some of the officers were killed. Um, she, she was unemployed because of that, at least initially. Uh, and they reassigned her temporarily in Dnipro. And she also, um, her aunt uh, was, was killed in, in, in a bomb blast that directly hit the apartment where she lived, uh, could not have a funeral for her, never recovered the body. And so she had a lot of loss. And just to tell you a little bit more about her, um, she, she knew I was going to be there, and she just, she just wanted to meet us. And we all gave her some money because the next morning, she was going to drive for 17 hours in a little tiny car with her adopted daughter. That was her sister's child. Um, she had adopted five, and she was a teenager now. Uh, and that evening, we had dinner, all of us together. Um, but, she, um, but, but she said, I just don't know how we can afford to, to go over there. I, these people aren't scam artists. I mean, you know, just, we have a history with these people. And so I know Tim gave her some money. John gave her some money. I gave her some money. Um, and later that night, um, when we had dinner together, because she was going to be leaving the first thing in the morning, she said, can you stay, Greg? And, and her adopted daughter was there. Can we have coffee? And I, I talked to my team. I said, you know, you may not think this is the wisest thing, but I, I've got $1,300 left on my debit card for, you know, the, the PayPal account. Um, and I'm going to give it to her for her and her daughter to get a start uh, when they're going to be over by the Carpathians, uh, where she was going to be going, way over, you know, southwest, beautiful area, I guess. Never been there. Uh, and so I did that, and she cried, of course. And, and she looks at me, she says, what, you know, with translation, she says, I'm going to use this for my daughter's education. So, and in fact, she's only used a portion of it because I, I get a record of that. Uh, but I gave her the pen, you know. And it's exhausted when it's exhausted, it's exhausted. Um, and, you know, and, and we all did stuff like that. We all did stuff like that. And then money here and there where it needed to be, you know, where it thought it would really go. And, and now she's working. She's working as a police psychologist in that oblast over by uh, in the Carpathian Mountain area. So this is the last night at the, at the resort here. And um, Tim here is a trainer in DARE, international trainer in DARE. And he has, they have D.A.R.E. t-shirts in Iowa, and they were different colors, different days. So he gave one, John wore his blue one, and I said, I don't have a D.A.R.E. shirt. You know, I'm, and he said, well, I'll give you a red one. So I had a red D.A.R.E. shirt. We wore it to dinner that night. So, um, But this is Pablo, and he and his wife, the next morning before they left, because we were getting ready to head back toward Kiev, um, had brought us the best chocolate. It was pretty good chocolate, wasn't it, Grace? It did not last long. In fact, it would not fit in my suitcase. So we actually, so Tim said, I've got an extra su suitcase. You know, I'll send it to you. He didn't want any money. So did that. All right. This is our last major stop um, was actually in, so we're kind of working our way back. Um, this used to be a Russian military resort, a retreat center for training, relaxation. Um, you know, when it was a part of the Soviet Union. It's now a military training center for, for Ukraine. And it's beautiful. It's got walkways. There's some paddle boats. In fact, I think there's a paddle boat right there. Picture's kind of obscured on the screen. Um, but, um, but again, nothing was air conditioned. I was like, in fact, Tim said, if we go back again, let's go in the winter or something again. <laughs> you know, whatever. So, um, but this is a building where we're going to be for most of what we were going to be doing. 
So I'm going to show you, okay, um, this one is a psychologist. Um, these young ladies wanted a picture with me, so I, I don't know why, but they did. <laughs> They're all kids, you know, like, and they kind of giggle, and it's like, okay, well, I think your grandpa. <laughs> but this, being around the U.S., anybody from the United States who's willing to come over there and help them, you know? So they wanted a picture with us, um, and some of them are psychologists. So it's Tim, John, and myself, plus these young ladies. If you look at them, they look like they're 12 years old, right? Um, this young lady right here had been in police service for five years. So I was thinking, how can I? I, I, I know I'm getting old when I'm thinking, really, you know? So, oh, this is a, <laughs> we were having technical difficulties when I was setting up to do a presentation. This is one of the things we always do. I won't make you guys do it here in church, but we did this in 19 too. But I want you to listen to this. John, John jumped in there and let him in that. No, that's enough. <laughs> um, we, we also had one of the things that was really kind of nice um, with them because it was a more intimate setting was that John, being a pastor and myself, we offered communion to anybody who wanted it. So after the training was over, we, we, it was brought outside. It was a lovely evening. And, and he had his stolen. He said, no, no, don't get your stolen because I actually brought my, my red stolen. And I said, bring red because usually that's just worn in Pentecost. But actually it's worn, uh, for, it, it, it's, a, it's also a symbol of passion. So we're going to wear that. So, uh, so we, we were ministering communion, um, you know, uh, kind of the intention like we used to do. So anyway, this is Alex and I, T-shirts, all kinds of T-shirts. In fact, I got one set of T-shirts. I came back. It was too small for me. So it's Grace's now. She, she, it fits her. It doesn't fit me. It didn't fit me at all. So, yeah. Okay. So, okay. On all of those miles in the road, Eugene is a music writer. He writes a lot of Christian evangelical Christian music. And, but this is an English song. You'll recognize this song. Uh, it's a lovely piece. So we, he'd be playing music, and I said, send me your playlist for Spotify. Um, and so, but he'd be driving on the highway, and this, he would do this occasionally. So I totally got a couple of videos in here. That's our driver. <laughs> and I said, okay, hands back on the wheel. <laughs> uh, Alex had bought this for um, his sheriff in Fulton County where, you know, and, and so the, all the guys, they made me put it on, you know, because they, the, the entire time, they, because I had the two medals. You got two medals, you know, given the government. I've got... And they were given one by the school, and, and it's like they, they were calling me the General Admiral Ga. So they were saying Ga. So they made me, th that's where that comes from. But we, you joke around, right? So, um, but now, you may not want to see this. These are bathrooms in a convenience store further west, western Ukraine. This is a, this is a toilet roll holder. So you see that everywhere, you know, those kind of little things, and lots of smiley faces. Now, the gas pump's there. You, you complain about, we complain about gas here. In Europe, you know what the cost of gas is by the liter? You know, translated to dollars, what that cost? About $12, $14 a gallon. And it's been that way forever, you know. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a real problem. So they have some, they have diesel, a lot of diesel. Uh, didn't see too much electric. Did see some. But also a lot of cars that are run on natural gas. And they would actually have attendants come out, like the old days. We remember the attendants come out, and they'd wash your car, and they'd wash your windows, and, you know, check your air, and all that kind of stuff. They do that there, you know, so you just go in and get your... Uh, by the way, their coffee there is Americana coffee, Americana coffee. I know Heather said they had that, so I, I, I got to get in to see her sometime and get some of that, that coffee. So, all right. And this is tea, I think. I don't know if they brought it. Okay, now... Um, you know, I'm glad you haven't fallen asleep on me yet. Um, when we were in Lubny, which in 
Poltova, Poltava, uh, that oblast, it's kind of on its way back to Kiev. So we're going to be kind of retracing our steps, Dnipro being further southeast. Then we kind of went a little bit, a little bit further north and west to Lubny, where this was. And the colonel called and said, I want to see you guys again. Plus, there was a gal who was, she was like an assistant to the chief in Mariupol. Uh, and she had to flee, obviously, Mariupol. And she, they said, we're bringing in all of these Russian tanks and, and you know, just all this armored vehicles, m multiple rocket launchers, all of that kind of stuff um, for the celebration, the independence celebration from the Soviet Union. It was it 91 or something like that, if I remember my history, uh, which was two days later. And he said, and, and the colonel said, just come right downtown. I'll be waiting for you. So he was on the phone with Eugene. And, and there was a car parked right behind the colonel's car, and the colonel made them move so we could park right by him. All right, okay. I mean, it was nice, and they said, okay, sure. And, and we walked up and down the street with he, his wife, and others, uh, and, and looked at uh, some of the Russian military hardware that was there on display. Some was still being brought in, so um, big old tanks, you know, some of those kinds of things. This one here, no, this is not the video. Uh, some of these pictures aren't very good because I was taking them against the light. It's on, it's on the central city square, okay? Now, this one is a video. What I want you to notice here, though, is, 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 is a couple of days prior to the celebration, um, this couple, it's a very brief little, they're bringing in Russian equipment. You know, there was momentary joy. Um, these people, you know, that um, they are, they, they really, they really, really connect very deeply with the Cossack, the Cossacks, you know, that Cossack warrior mentality. Uh, and you see that everywhere. You see a lot of pictures of that. So, okay. Now, um, so, does that remind you of a Dalek? Sheila? I took that picture for you when I was over there, by the way. You know, like, exterminate, exterminate, if any of you watch Doctor Who. So anyway, um, now, Ezovstal Ev um, was, was a seal plant where a lot of the were Russian, they were, they were Ukrainian police and soldiers protecting civilians who were trapped there. And they were being surrounded and bombarded by huge, by, you know, by greatly outnumbered forces. It was being bombed all the time if you were watching the news when this was going on. It was almost like the Alamo, you know, last stand. And, and they heroically did it. And, um, and this, was in, this was actually in the city building. Um, there was a bomb landed uh, yesterday not too far from there with Putin's uh, trying to knee-jerk response to get back. Uh, I think if I put in, I, I think I've inserted yesterday um, a different sl a slide showing you one of those defenders. Yeah, here he is. Uh, Misha, we were actually in his office. Those of you who, you know, when I did the presentation on our trip in 2019, there was a, a Scud missile in his office there. He had a big U.S. flag in his office. He's a police chief. He was captured, um, and he disappeared for a long time. He was one of those defenders, heroic defenders, in, in the steel plant. And there he is right there. You can tell, looking at him. Um, I didn't hardly recognize him from what I remember him being before. I've got pictures of him from war. But he was, uh, it was kind of a prisoner exchange. Okay. This was actually, if you're wondering what this says, that says Ukraine. Or basically, I love Ukraine. Okay? So this is, uh, this is a young lady that was a, an assistant in the police department in Ukraine. She, uh, we gave her some money as well. Um, she was living with a friend in, in Kiev. We couldn't, you could tell she's not doing her well. Here's, here's the colonel and his wife. And, and of course, that ugly guy right there and the rest of our team. So, all right. Now, one of the things that was really adjacent to this right here, it would be just off to my, my left here in the picture, is this right here. Ukrainian soldiers that had perished, um, they would plant a flag in Kiev with the name, the name and, and some, some sort of, you know, loving remembrance or something in, in honor of them. Um, it, was, it was big, but it's not as number... They have not lost as many people. They've lost a lot of civilians. 
because Putin doesn't care where he drops bombs and does things. Um, but um, the Russian military has lost a lot, a lot more people than, than Ukraine has. Um, this is back in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, we basically drove all through the night to catch it, and we had to be at the airport at 3 in the morning, um, and we had a dinner together. And yeah, so yeah, this is what we do at our downtime. And by the way, um, if you know the, um, you know the um, sheepdog stuff, this is, this is it says send me, you know sheepdog stuff on the back that um, actually uh, Bruce gave me from the church. So before we left, and of course this is uh, Eugene, great guy. Um, one final hug. And basically, um, what does that say? This is the last slide. What does that say? Want to take a guess? No, no. Good guess. May God bless all of us. So that, that is it. It was a little over an hour. So uh, I hope it was worth you coming out and spending some time. Um, I will teach you goodbye so you can say it to me when we all. But I mean, we, I will take questions too. Um, Dopo Vachenya is goodbye. I think I taught Bob that once, didn't I, Bob? One of the times you were here for church. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can work it into one of your one of your magic routines or something. Uh, dopo bachanya, dopo bachanya. So, in fact, I had to go dopo bachanya. So, and but you know, with any foreign language, there are a lot of trills of R's and stuff, and it's like I can't make my tongue do that. You know. So, anyway, so that that's it. Um, thank you for. You know, you know. And our, our Ukrainian friends knew this was going to be happening tonight, and they said, keep praying for us, you know. Thank you for getting the word out. So, you know, so that's how we do it, you know. Um, they do, would like me to come back. Just to tell you how I ended up going there this time, when the war broke out on February 24th, um, Grace and I were watching some new, one of the news channels, and, you know, I was, because I was really, I, I, I was very close to a lot of these people. And she says, what did you say? She just looked at you and said, here's what I meant you. I said, yeah, yeah. And I appreciate the church and the community supporting, you know, vicariously because it's part of our saviors. It's ministry in the trenches. It really is. And, uh, you know, and people say, how can you go there and do that? Well, you know, somebody's got to, you know. And I just happen to be equipped to be able to do that. Uh, in, in terms of what I've experienced and, and what, I've, what I've learned and those kinds of things. So why not, you know? So it's not everybody's cup of tea. I know uh, when this war is over, they're going to need a lot of bridge building, physical bridge building, engineering bridge building. So that, that's, a, that's a conversation that the Bob and I say, no, he can't go. <laughs> you have to check with the boss on that one. So. But anyway, so... Um, no, I couldn't have done this without your support. I couldn't. So, what questions? Any other questions you have? Food questions? Anything like that? I was just, I guess, I had that impression that there was a real food shortage, but maybe at least while you were here, it's been supplemented. And I'm not sure who was providing Well, some, some of the areas still that are getting bombed a lot, these isolated areas right now, that they're freeing. You know, like they just, just freed, you know. Um, you know, going going east and south, uh, those areas. Uh, some of those people that are they're elderly there, they're just now getting into, have been starving, and they're living in horrendous conditions. You know, like in a basement or or something like that. And um, in Mariupol, they were trying to have to melt rain, uh, snow, to try and drink that. You know, when they were, you know, when he was just bombing the heck out of Mariupol. So yeah. So yeah, so but a lot of a lot of organizations, and the food gets where it needs to go. A lot of people say, ah, oh, they're corrupt. No, I mean you work, we're working through these Christian organizations, and a lot of you know nonprofit organizations have made a lot of inroads. And there's a, the guy who does the uh, food. He's 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 serving millions of people around the world. Now he's he's back and he's got a group in Florida too. You know, for the hurricane, people, you know, who need that temporarily until, you know, until we get things kind of built up again. So, yeah, I mean, there's a need. I mean, 
So they, they need, they certainly need our prayers. Um, in fact, the, the, the uh, my congregation, my family doesn't want to probably hear this, but the, the uh, colonel, uh, he, when we were heading back, we, we figured, well, th that's the other thing. I didn't take a picture of it. Just tell you how we got through the border going from Ukraine into back into Poland. Uh, he said, he said, I'm getting reports from all these places where you presented. And he said, they're just saying, we would love more of this. We'd love more of this. This is so helpful. You're an inspiration. You're bringing hope and helping them. I had a couple of female psychologists at the retreat center come up to me with tears in their eyes and saying, you know, we had a psychologist here who was talking to us about PTSD. And they said, um, and they said, after hearing you talking about moral trauma, this is what we have. This is what we have. I said, you have both. You can have both, but they're different. So that's a whole other lecture. So, but, but anyway, so yeah, there, there's a need. There's a need. And they need our support. I mean, some people think, why? You know, I mean, the uh, U.S. tried an isolationist thing with World War II, with wars prior to that. No. Nah. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, we have needs here. You know, that, we could argue that for sure. I don't disagree with that. But, um, but we have s people here that can provide that. You know, that's what I think what makes, makes this country a great one. So, yeah. So, so by proxy, you were there with me. So, any other questions? No other questions? That wasn't happening. I, I don't know what that's all about, oh. you know. I really don't, um, you, you know, because that, that preceded me. But obviously you got some people, especially those who don't want, you know, any kind of church there, you know. And it didn't matter whether it's a church, whether it's a synagogue. They just weren't a faith-based group. So, yeah, so, yeah, because you saw that and you saw the domed, yeah. you know. Uh, interesting story. Well, let me tell you about the uh, border crossing. We were told we had to be catch a six caught fight in Warsaw, Poland, and we were driving all the way from Kiev, not, not Rivnet, you know, which is closer to the border. And so we knew we were going to be driving all night, and we may not, depending on the border of Ukrainian refugees still trying to go into Poland, um, that we might not make our flight. And the colonel said, my colonel friend said, if you have a problem, have Eugene call us, or call me, and, and we'll set that up. Well, uh, I don't think Eugene ever did call him because he and I were messaging back and forth using Google Translate. The colonel only was uh, all the way to the border, and we got up there. And Eugene just he just he just takes off, drives around. What would have been probably we figured about a 12-hour a 12-hour time the end of the line miles long would be at least 12 hours to go through the checkpoint, the border crossing, which would mean we would have missed everything. We would have missed everything. But we were prepared. We had enough money that we needed to stay in a hotel. I said, make sure you have some money in reserve. Uh, and we did. But he drove right all, all the way up to the front of the line. He drove in the other lanes. And it's, it's a big checkpoint. It's like, I'm, I said, I don't want to look at these people. Because <laughs> they're standing outside their cars for hours. And, you know, being who I am, it's like, oh, man, what about those people, you know? And, uh, and he talked to them. And they let us cut right in. And, and off we went. Uh, there, there are actually a number of gas, convenience store gas stations, you know, that have not been bombed, you know. So, um, and right now, gas is not a daily um, uh, scarcity, uh, you know. So we did have to gas up occasion quite a, quite a bit with all those miles and driving a big old van with all of us in it and all this, our suitcases and luggage and equipment. So yeah, so gas was was not an issue. It was just very expensive. Yeah. So were there areas where the roads were actually bombed out? Oh yeah. Oh, Lord. You would bring that up, Doug. <laughs> yes. There were a lot of places where we actually had to go. They had set up a temporary bridge. You know, fortunately, it was not great big expanses of, of water like a river, a stream, or something like that. Yeah. And, and now, I think with uh, what Putin did, he bombed a bridge we crossed many times, the two times I've been there, in Kiev, you know, that it crosses because the, you know, the, the river there, you know, in Kiev is huge. It, it's very wide. Uh, kind of looks like Mississippi, and he bombed that. He bombed that bridge. So, you know, the people were commuting, and a lot of them were killed, you know, because they hit hit that, you know, some other places too. So, playground. He bombed the playground. Kids in it. So, yeah. I mean, uh, so 
Yeah, yeah the, the roads were, the, I'm not complaining about the roads here. Maybe Division Road. I think you can do something with Division Road. Because <laughs> uh, you know, like construction along it, it's pretty bumpy. So, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Well, I, um, as we were literally still in the city limits of Dnipro, which is a city of several hundred thousand people, um, um, we had gotten, uh, Eugene got, 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 was messaging and, and Alex in the front seat of the van, and I was right behind them. The other two guys were behind me. And it said, uh, they just launched four missiles at, at Dnipro. And, and they looked around and said, they're basically four of us, you know. They have our name on each of them, you know. <laughs> and, um, but you know, one of the things, thanks to the U.S., thanks to Britain, thanks to Germany and France, their, their air defense systems are great. Uh, half the missiles that, that Putin launched this time were actually intercepted. Intercepted, yeah. So um, due to that. And, you know, they, I, I tell Grace, I said, they weren't there, but one of the, the places in Kiev that was bombed was a German, it used to be a German embassy. Um, that's just going to get Germany more involved, you know. So the Germany, you know, that we like. You know, so anyway, yeah. So, yeah, I could tell you lots of stories, lots of stories. It, um, it's very much a part of who I am, so. And I think it just hopefully makes me a better pastor, you know, just um, having those kinds of experiences I could bring back. I wouldn't preach on it every Sunday, because I'm sure you get tired of hearing that, but, <laughs> but anyway. So, any other thoughts or questions, comments, observations, things that I did not cro cover? Any, any, could you say that again, Bob? Um, since you were training all these chaplains how to deal with... Actually, police, police and our psychologists, too, so... I would, we had lots of individual contact with people that were hurting. And the fact, the fact is, a lot of these people that were in those positions had lost loved ones themselves. So, I mean, they were, they were traumatized themselves, too. So, you know, we were doing it for them so that they can recognize it, you know, in themselves and maybe what to do about it, and then, but also then continue to serve. So that's probably the best way I can answer that question for you. Yeah. No, it was a great experience. You know, it really was. Um, was not a, um, was not a, a vacation by any, by any stretch, but... Um, I, people always ask me and say, well, in fact, when I was, I went to see an urgent care doc at Freighter, when I, the shingles, and I, I said, in two and a half weeks, I'm leaving for Ukraine. And he said, and he stops what he's doing, and he takes off his glasses. He's an older guy, like me, and he reached out and says, thank you for going there. He said, if I was a younger doc, I would go with the doctors, you know, without borders kind of thing. He thanked me three times for going over there. And as we're going out the as I'm going out the door after he'd written me a script for a couple of things, uh, he said, I said, he thanked me again. I said, Doc, why did you become a doctor? Why did you become a pastor? Why, why, why do we do any of those kinds of things? I said, you get it. You get it. I, I, I said, you know, I didn't get in the money part, but I said, you go into nursing, whether you go into, you know, whatever it is you do, you, you do it to serve, you know? And, and ultimately, that's doing something meaningful like that. And, you know, so we kind of actually hugged, you know. You hugged, so, you know, Doc, I didn't even know. So, you know, that's good. Holy hug. Holy. <laughs> we do the holy hug here. So, anyway, so, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. No, I could tell you a story. As, as Ron said on, downstairs on yesterday, he said, oh, he'll tell you stories. I'm trying to, I'm trying to not tell too many stories, Ron. saying. Any questions for you who, uh, I, any of the visitors that are here today? Any thoughts or questions? You know what my answer to that is? 
Well, you are. You are there by supporting those of us who do that. Um, you know, and I tell people, is it takes all of us. It takes all of us collectively to, to do. So one of the things I always said wherever I went um, to kind of open things up, I said, we are bringing the love and support of all the people we are connected to, to you. Not just prayers, but love in tangible ways that we can provide. I said, it, you know, and, and we're bringing all of that, and we're just representatives of that. So, yeah, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So I'm an old guy, but I tell you what, those three hours of sleep each night and then go, 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 go. That gets kind of old. I mean, it would be nice. To, can we stay in this reserve a little longer? Can we sleep in at 9 o'clock? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, no chance. <laughs> Plus, it's eight hours time difference there, if you're wondering about that. And yes, we eat a lot of borscht. There's good borscht and bad borscht. So. But they're very healthy eaters. They eat a lot of vegetables there, a lot of vegetables in their food. Um, a lot of tea, drink a lot of tea. A lot of fruit juice. It's not like fruit juice like we pick up in a you know, the supermarket. Um, but it's kind of an infused, like, apple pear, kind of diluted, you know, um, kind, kind of drink. But, but refreshing, but a whole lot healthier than sometimes I eat anyway. I can't speak of the rest of you, you know. So, but, uh, you know, didn't see any McDonald's or any of those things. I'm sure they're around somewhere, but probably in Kiev, but, but not there. So, And coffee. Their coffee is very strong. <laughs> Americana coffee that they serve there is like, Espresso in a larger cup. So, yep, good stuff, good stuff. So, anyway, spread the word. So, um, I will probably go back, you know, with the church's permission at some point. You know, right now with what's going on with Putin, you know, it's, that's going to have to wait, see what there is to go back to. But, you know, uh, as you all know, the war is still going on. People, somebody asked me, he said, are they still fighting over there? Yeah, yeah, they they are. A lot of people are still losing lives over there. So yeah, you know. So yeah, and and they uh, they just love our support. So you know, one of the, their expressions is "Slava Ukraini." Um, you know what that is? In fact, I, I did it with the students twice. I had them stand up and do that during the two hours. You know, so they didn't fall asleep on me during my moral trauma <laughs> lecture. And it and they stood up, and you could have heard it blocks away. Glory to Ukraine. It's like we say, God bless the USA or whatever would be. I mean, for them, it's just like, this is their homeland. You know, they believe in freedom. They want freedom, you know, and they wanted that long before this war broke out, you know, so, yeah, but Russia's always kind of this luminaire. So, yeah, who knows what Putin will do? That's all in the conversation, but uh, anyway, so, so, Two checkpoints, because first you have to go through the Ukrainian, um, and then, of course, they check your passport and, and, and ask you questions about what you got with you and that kind of stuff. So um, then you go through the Polish one, a little further down. They're kind of like together, but not right together. There's probably eight to a quarter mile, somewhere in that distance between the two checkpoints. Of course, it depends on the checkpoint. Well, I don't know what provisions that they made for those who were fleeing when the war first broke out. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sure they. I, I'm sure they had, you know, some sort of visa or something. I'm sure they had arrangements. I never asked that question, you know, Oliver. You know, to be honest with you, but but yeah, I mean, if they're fleeing the country and they need to get out of, you know whatever Russia is throwing at them, you know, it's just, yeah, yeah, so. So anyway, so thank you all. God bless all of you. God bless all of you. And by the way, the Ukrainian flag, by the way, and I've just got a few things here, not, not much. My medals are up there in the various patches. I can explain those to you uh, if you want to see any of those. But, um, the, you know, the flag is blue with yellow or gold. Look at that picture. That's where it comes from. Either wheat fields that are gold and ripe or the blue sky. That's where it comes from. 
Yeah, it is. It is a sunflower. Yep. So plant sunflowers next spring. Not, not now, but next spring. Our squirrels plant plenty of sunflowers from our bird feeder. But. <laughs> so thank you guys. So hopefully this was, no, 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 no.